Hi, I'm Bob Dennis, and today I'm going to talk about PEMF and electrosmog, and how those relate to EMF, EMI, and RFI safety. An emerging health problem is electromagnetic hypersensitivity, EMH. EMH apparently affects thousands of people, but perhaps many more than that are actually sensitive and just don't know it. It is supposedly caused by increasing amounts of high-frequency wireless noise in the environment due to Wi-Fi and dirty power lines, switching power supplies which are hooked to all of our devices. EMI and RFI can be easily detected and measured using handheld meters, and they can be minimized by careful electronic design. Before we start discussing this, before we start saying that EMF is bad for you or it causes health problems, let's take an intelligent look at the electromagnetic spectrum and understand it before we talk about how it relates to health and illness. The simple fact is that the electromagnetic spectrum is essential for life. If we look just at the visible light part of the spectrum, which is indicated by the green bracket, it turns out that that part of the spectrum is essential for vision, and it's also essential for plants for photosynthesis, and we eat plants. So visible light is clearly an essential part of life on Earth. But there's a lot more to the electromagnetic spectrum than just visible light. If you look at the green bracket here, it's indicating infrared. And infrared is essential for heat and warmth, also essential features required in the environment for life to exist. But we're also finding that there are many health benefits from infrared. People are starting to use infrared saunas, for example, to take advantage of the many known and emerging health benefits. So infrared, even though we can't see it, is a very important part of the electromagnetic spectrum for life. The ultraviolet part of the spectrum is also essential. It can be dangerous, but UVB is essential in the synthesis of vitamin D in the skin. And UVA has also been found to be essential for the release of nitric oxide into the circulation from the skin. Now that's the positive benefit of UVA, but then it also tends to destroy folic acid, which means that UV is kind of a mixed bag as far as being essential and beneficial for life. You certainly benefit from having UV exposure, but you want to keep the exposure in a reasonable range. Otherwise, you get things like sunburns and potential melanomas, and you get excess destruction of folic acid. Way down at the low frequency end of the electromagnetic spectrum, where we have steady DC magnetic fields, we're looking at the Earth's magnetic field, and that is essential for life on Earth. It protects us from the solar wind, and we can see this effect when we see the aurora borealis. That's charged particles that are very damaging to life streaming from the sun and being deflected from areas on Earth where most people live and funneled into the north and south poles. But the basic steady magnetic field is also essential for navigation. Migratory birds, fish, whales, turtles, and other animals, including lately humans, use that basic, steady magnetic field of the Earth for navigation. In the extremely low frequency range, we have the ELF, or long wave electromagnetism. Now this is what characterizes many biological signals from ion channels, pumps, and transporters, action potentials on nerves and synaptic transmission, brain waves, which we measure through EEG, and muscle contraction, which we measure through EMG. And this tends to be in the range of about 0.1 to maybe a few hundred hertz. So if we gather up all the ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum that are known to be helpful with green brackets, we have some areas that really don't seem to be helpful for life. And they may potentially be harmful, or they're known to be harmful for living organisms. These are shown in red brackets. 
this pretty much the lower frequency end is kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz in the shortwave radio and microwave ranges. In the high frequency range, that's usually called ionizing radiation, and that's intense ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. And by ionizing radiation, what that means is that there's enough energy there to actually break up molecules and create ions. And this is known to be highly damaging to life in almost every form. Um, the real one that's under question is the sort of longer wave, lower frequency range, short wave radios and microwaves. And that's in the kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz range. And that's the one that most people refer to when they're talking about electrosmog. Now, there's nothing unnatural about harmful electromagnetism. It occurs naturally. Most of it occurs in outer space, but the Earth's atmosphere blocks out most of it, especially at the higher frequencies. We get almost no X-rays or gamma rays from outer space uh, that reach the surface of the Earth. We also get very few short, wave, short radio waves and uh, microwaves, but uh, they do exist, and they are in the natural background at very low levels. But here's the problem. In the last hundred years or so, we've generated a lot of man-made EMF. And the problem is that that EMF is local. It's in our places of work, it's in our environment, it's in our homes. And it's too close to be shielded by the atmosphere. This is very close to us. We don't have a whole big thick atmosphere blanketing us like we do from EMF from outer space. And the other problem is that that man-made EMF has increased millions of times over the natural background levels of electromagnetic radiation. So we didn't evolve with this in our environment. This is something entirely new, and we don't really have the biological mechanisms to deal with it. And the real health problem that we seem to be experiencing a lot is that much of the man-made EMF in our daily environments is in the potentially harmful range of kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz from dirty power lines and wireless. So based on the earlier discussion, it's very clear that electromagnetic fields, EMF, can be either healthy and even essential for life, or they can be harmful. It depends entirely on the type and the dose. That is, it depends on the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of exposure. So just to make the discussion clear, we have electromagnetic fields, and those are in our environment, and they can be healthy and essential, or they can cause harm. But we will designate that type of EMF that causes harm those that interfere with other devices, but more importantly, interfere with organisms, we will call those EMI, which stands for electromagnetic interference. EMI can have very harmful biological effects, from sunburns and cataracts to cancer and derangements of other cellular functions, and that falls under the category of electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And even though EMH is still questioned by many health professionals, there are certain effects of excess exposure to electromagnetism that are clearly unhealthy. And you can look this up and read for yourself. Different people come down in different places on their opinions on this. Um, but it is an emerging field, and it's becoming more and more recognized as an environmental health problem. So that brings us to a discussion of PEMF and how it relates to EMI. PEMF stands for pulsed electromagnetic fields, and therefore, by definition, it must emit pulses of electromagnetism. But then the question is, is PEMF EMI, that is, is it harmful? Well, not necessarily. It is possible to generate PEMFs using signals that are interpreted by cells as healthy and natural forms of electromagnetism. This is done by using only signals native to biology, those in the natural bioelectrical signal range of less than a few hundred hertz at very low energy. 
It is also important to remove all unnecessary energy from the PEMF pulses so they appear clean, giving a clear and uncluttered signal to the cells. Extra energy must not be added. No attempt should be made to force any biological effects. PEMF should be viewed as information, not a way to force a cell or tissue to do anything by the application of excess energy. The signals from PEMF should emulate natural signals related to health, growth, locomotor activity, exercise, and tissue re regeneration. Well, ideally that's how PEMF should work, but not all PEMF does. Some PEMF is based on my original work at NASA from 20 years ago, and it has evolved in the direction of more power, where people are attempting to force biological effects by the application of excess energy. That, however, is very different from the developmental path that I've taken. I've developed a technology referred to as ICES to distinguish it from standard PEMF. ICES stands for Inductively Coupled Electrical Stimulation, and it has evolved over 20 years of development to become more based on natural bioelectricity. That is to say, the signals are intended to transmit only information and not excess energy. And because I'm doing that, I've been able to remove most of the energy. In fact, I'm only using about one five hundredth of the amount of energy that was initially applied. So it's 0.2% of the power and still getting the same or in fact better biological benefits. The way this works is pretty complicated. I mean, there's some calculus involved. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, and it was mostly empirical. I mean, I had to take a lot of measurements, and I couldn't calculate everything from first principles. So it wasn't all just math. It was a lot of experiments and measurements. But the way that it evolved over time was that I was able to find those small percentages of the pulsed field that actually had biological benefits and I kept removing all of the parts of the signal that had no benefit at all. So ICES uses ultra low power and very low frequency. It generates electrical stimulation of the cells through electromagnetic induction and it uses a pattern that simulates the natural signals of exercise and normal locomotory activity. So only the fields are, that are recognized by cells as natural are included in the signals that I'm applying with ICES. And all non-essential high-frequency electromagnetic components are eliminated from the signals. And by doing this, I've been able to take 99.8% of the energy out of ICES and maintain or even improve the biological benefits. So there are international standards for electromagnetic safety, and there are what are called safe environmental exposure limits. So in this graph, the vertical line is the magnetic field in microtesla, and the horizontal line is frequency, that is, how frequently are you generating pulses. Um, there is an internationally recognized safe area, which is shown in green. And then there's a questionable area shown in yellow, and then there's a danger zone shown in red. And this is all based on the ICN IRP guidelines, which is the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. And they periodically publish a handbook that establishes the internationally recognized safe versus dangerous exposure levels. And if you look on this graph, in the blue diamond, I've plotted the energy range energy and frequency range of ICES, which is well within the safe zone, considered internationally safe um, for exposure to all people um, for unlimited periods of time. Well, understandably, not everybody follows the international guidelines because the ICN IRP guidelines do not recognize electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome, and they assume that the injuries caused by electromagnetism are more of the standard types that are recognized by mainstream medicine. 
So some people take matters into their own hands and actually measure the electromagnetic fields in their environment using a device such as the one shown here. This is an Acousticom 2 electrosmog detector, and you'll notice that it's sensitive over the range of 200 megahertz to 8 gigahertz, which is pretty much covers the range of lower frequency um, potential harm in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the device has an audible signal, sounds sort of like a Geiger counter, and it's louder and nastier sounding when you're in an environment with a lot of uh, background electromagnetic fields, but it also has, more importantly, a visual scale, which is shown here, going from 0 0.01 up to 6.0, which is actually in units of volts per meter. That's the voltage generated in the air around you from ambient electromagnetic fields. So based on this meter, levels of 0 0.01 and 0 0.02 are considered basically safe. That's sort of like the background that you might expect in an environment that's not really polluted with too much with too much electrosmog. But the environment in your home can quickly go up through the yellow and orange range and into the red range, which I'll show you in a minute, which are considered dangerously high levels of electromagnetic radiation or electrosmog. These are very easy meters to use. You just basically turn them on and read the value. And I'll show you how you do that in sort of a home environment here in the next few slides. This video shows an IECES coil placed close to the Acousticom 2 to measure its electromagnetic interference. The IECES coil tester, it's hexagonal, will flash green to show that the coils are actually working. But with the coils close to the Acousticom 2, you'll notice that it doesn't change the EMI. It doesn't go up from background. You'll notice when the coils are moved away, the Acousticom 2 is still detecting the same background level of electrosmog, which means that it's not detecting any EMI in the harmful range that the detector is designed to detect. The electrosmog detector generally shows much higher levels of background EMF in a typical household. This video is showing the background EMF near a typical extension cord with uh, switching power supplies that you find all over in modern homes. You'll notice that that background level is much higher than the background that was detected even with the ICES PEMF near the detector. The worst EMI levels are typically found near wireless routers. This shows that the sensor, as I bring it close to a wireless router, is maxed out at 6 volts per meter. So although the ambient electromagnetic fields are probably higher than that, that's as high as the meter can measure. And this is why people tell you if you want to reduce your EMI exposure, first thing to do is get rid of your wireless routers in your homes. Returning again to the ICES PEMF, you can see that the electrosmog detector doesn't detect any harmful electromagnetism from the coils or from the ICES pulse generator unit, which is blue. Now, it's important to note that that's with the ICES turned up to full power. So even at full power, ICES does not generate detectable levels of adverse EMF. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it was informative and please feel free to visit our website and contact us if you have any questions.